Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Pereira. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Chinese President Xi Jinping held their first bilateral meeting since the Doklam standoff. Their meeting at the BRICS summit in China's port city of Xiamen came just days after the two countries resolved the almost three-month-long border dispute. According to Chinese state media, she told Modi that healthy, stable China-India ties were necessary. Prime Minister Modi congratulated Xi on a very successful execution of the three-day BRICS summit in a show of conciliatory support between the two leaders. On this edition of The Big Picture, we'll discuss the takeaways from the 2017 BRICS summit. Joining me on the program today are Jabin T. Jacob, Fellow, Institute of Chinese Studies, Delhi. Also joining me on the program, Shushan Sarin, strategic affairs expert, and uh, S.R. Thayal, former diplomat. Thank you so much to all my guests for joining me on this edition of uh, The Big Picture. Ambassador Thayal, I'd like to begin with you. What are the takeaways, really, do you think from an India's point of view at BRICS 2017? If we look at it from India's point of view, I think we can um, have uh, many satisfactions. One is that, uh, of course, terrorism has been mentioned very strongly. And this is an advance from the Goa declaration. And in Goa, our Prime Minister had to really make a pitch for uh, uh, anti-terrorist sentiments. But the statement was not very strong. But here, whatever we wanted is there. The, the organizations have been named, which are based in Pakistan. Mm. And such a statement getting issued from Chinese territory, I think, is a big plus for us. Second, where uh, we, I see India's invisible hand is that five guests were invited by China, special guests outside BRICS. And they are Thailand, Mexico, Egypt, Guinea and Tajikistan. Why is Pakistan not there? If China itself did not invite Pakistan, which is their bosom friend, which is their best friend in the neighborhood, why? And if they wanted to invite, did, were we able to prevail upon China not to invite Pakistan? And the third thing, where I think our views prevailed was on BRI. In the entire declaration, Xiamen declaration, there is no mention of uh, uh, Belt and Road Initiative. And the only country which has strong reservations on BRI are India and Bhutan. And it was not mentioned there, which is a great uh, matter of satisfaction for us. And I will also say that in his plenary statement, uh, President Xi Jinping said that BRI is not a tool to advance a geopolitical agenda, but a platform for practical cooperation. Mm. So he took India's reservations on board. The Chinese as a host accommodated India's reservations. I think it is a very good takeaway for us and perhaps good for India-China bilateral relations also as we go forward. You know, Sushant Sarin, I'd like to bring you into the picture now. You know, as far as naming some of the Pakistani-based uh, terror outfits are concerned, the Pakistani media has re reacted to that. They have said that Chinese have let them down. Does that really mean anything? Well, uh, I think to the extent that the Pakistanis are spooked by uh, the declaration, uh, I think it's a matter of great satisfaction to us. Uh, but in real terms, what does it mean? Uh, I think we'll have to wait and see whether the Chinese position on, for example, Masood Azhar changes uh, when, uh, you know, the time comes for his, the inclusion of his name uh, in the uh, 1267 list. Uh, the Chinese have been resisting so far. Uh, so if that position changes and uh, because they have uh, agreed to uh, references to the Jaish e Mohammed in this particular declaration, it becomes even more uh, difficult for them uh, to keep resisting the chief of a terrorist organization from being designated as an international terrorist. Uh, so I think that incongruity uh, cannot be carried out indefinitely and even the Chinese are realizing and the grapevine in Pakistan is that the Chinese are telling the Pakistanis that you know it's becoming more and more difficult for them uh, to keep this technical hold going on. Uh, it might happen a couple of more times, but it cannot be done indefinitely. Is that the so next that logical step then? Is that the next uh, now, logical step? For the Pakistanis who... Well, that would be. But I think what is even more important is that the fact that there has been also references uh, to organizations like the Taliban and the Haqqani Network 
and a very strong statement in favor of uh, the Afghan government and uh, the Afghan national security forces and their fight against terrorism uh, and naming both, like I said, the Haqqani network and the Taliban, which are pets of Pakistan and uh, with which even the Russians and the Chinese have been flirting. Now, when you, uh, you know, add the whole thing together, uh, does this mean or does this indicate that there is a major shift in the Chinese position? I think we'll have to wait and see. It's still early days yet. Okay. I think it would be uh, rather premature and presumptuous of us to think that merely in this declaration, the Chinese are signaling a major and a tectonic shift in their policy towards Pakistan. I don't think that is likely to happen anytime soon. Uh, but perhaps, uh, you know, we managed to push the envelope a little bit. And to that extent, I think uh, that's that's good as far as Indian diplomacy is concerned. Okay, still early days. We'll have to wait and see what really happens on the ground in Pakistan is what you're suggesting. So we'll wait and see. In the meantime, let me bring in uh, uh, Jabin Jacob into the picture. The bilateral Xi Jinping and Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Did you think that that went on well in spite of, you know, just coming out of this uh, almost three-month-long tense standoff between the two nations? Well, I think it's a function of diplomacy to make sure that uh, these meetings go off well that they look good despite whatever else tensions might exist. Um, now, having said that, uh, just because a meeting appears to have gone off good and well doesn't mean that, you know, there aren't other problems in the relationship or that there isn't a problem around the corner. I mean, we had a, for what is all appearance, to all appearances, a great meeting in, uh, you know, Astana. Hmm. And uh, we had Doklam right after. So, let's not go by appearances. Uh, let's, you know, uh, wait and watch and, uh, you know, be prepared for whatever comes our way. Um, but, and, you know, just to take on the question of uh, this issue of uh, the declaration of these terrorist groups in the, uh, in the BRICS declaration, I think, again, you know, as uh, Mr. Sarin said, uh, I think I go with his view that, you know, we shouldn't read too much into it. The Chinese way of diplomacy is to actually make us really fight very hard for these simple you know, what to the rest of the world are extremely reasonable uh, steps to take. So I think they have taken their own sweet time to get to this stage. So are you suggesting the path ahead is going to be a difficult one then? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think as Mr. Sarin said that the Chinese cannot keep up this technical hold for too long without looking very bad in the process. It just doesn't uh, make sense for them. Plus, they also need to put pressure on the Pakistanis. Now, uh, so that's one side of the picture. The other side is remember that the Chinese are actually encouraging talks between the Taliban, the same Taliban that they have declared as, you know, uh, anathema in this declaration. They are also encouraging talks between the Afghan government and the Taliban. So they are doing, you know, they are playing both sides of the game. So let us, you know, wait and watch how the Chinese take this forward. Okay. Treacherous road ahead, but will India will have to play a tough balancing act is what you're suggesting. Supamoy Bhattacharya, welcome to the program. Business editor of uh, the, uh, the the consulting editor, I beg your pardon, of the Business Standard joins us on the program now. Uh, Supamoy, you know, as far as uh, the road ahead for India and China are concerned, what are the areas that we can work together to try and improve the relationship as has been suggested by the heads of states of both the countries? Uh, in terms of improving, there is a huge amount of things. Um, the river water sharing is one of those most classic ones. This year, for instance, the, uh, when this uh, Doklam thing was at its height, uh, a simple thing like the regular sharing of river water data, I, uh, which a riparian state like India <coughs> would need, even that fell into uh, a question of uh, uh, the c c c two countries' uh, strategic stay off. There are plenty of, and, and, and in terms of uh, India China, connections on uh, building on uh, <clears throat> trade, the issue of entry of uh, some of the issues that we have almost forgotten for a long time, which is the access of Indian pharmaceutical companies into India, into China, the issue of uh, IT trade. There are so many of those. The point is that, you know, right now, India and China will be facing each other or rather will be meeting each other regularly. And the big point of this sort of a meeting is that you'll never really be meeting at a perfectly, what I might call, peaceful position. There would be something or other music playing in the background. And it's, it's, it's a question of Indian government able to see that what are the 
short term things or with the medium term things which can be handled and which need to be taken forward despite all the sort of differences that would keep on coming because india china uh, to expect that you know the countries would be actually be finding a position where you know there are no discordant noises uh, i i think that that era is now totally clearly behind us it's a time when both the countries have to accept that there would be those differences and within that try to see what are the immediate necessities in any particular sector and focus on the deliverables there if sure. that is looked at then there would be a lot of uh, advantages which bo both countries can secure from each other fair enough ambassador have we just witnessed a resetting of ties between india and china or is it too early to make that assessment as of now it's too early uh, one uh, in foreign secretary uh, jay shankar's briefing he made two three very important points he said that the the leaders decided that the um, relationship will be forward looking that means they will not dwell too much on the past hmm. then he said that it will be it was a very constructive discussion on where the relationship should be headed that means they are looking at future where it should be headed at the third point that peace and tranquility at the border is a prerequisite he used the word prerequisite for this relationship to go forward so very clearly it has been told to china that ye must maintain peace and tranquility at the border otherwise whatever economy etc you know the compartmentalization okay border you can compartmentalize border you can talk later and say they're all right we will keep on talking but the rest of the relationship will be normalized but if doklam type incidents take place then relationship cannot be normal i think that message has gone here in this context the china experts are here i would like to say that some foreign analysts i have been talking to they have said that is there some dissonance between the pla hmm. and xi jinping you will remember 2015 when xi jinping was here there was some incident in uh, dapsang or somewhere else and all this the road construction was it with the full knowledge and approval of xi jinping or not that is for our china experts to to indeed, indicate indeed. Uh, so shan sarin do you want to add something to that the ambassador is suggesting that maybe the pla and xi jinping the president of china are not on the same page are you picking up the same kind of signals well there is some talk of that uh, you know some of the recent changes which have been made in the top brass of the chinese army uh, and xi jinping getting his own people in uh, some senior officers have been replaced especially the guy who was in charge of the tibet uh, area so some there there are some indications that some kind of a tussle might be on now uh, in a very opaque system like the chinese system uh, you know how relevant is this uh to what has been happening vis-a-vis -vis india uh, i think uh, you know it's anybody's guess uh, but uh, nevertheless i think uh, to just look at what has happened between india and china uh, in the recent past uh, from the prism of what is the interplay of forces within china i think uh, uh, wouldn't exactly be the right way to go about it because uh, let's face it there are uh, some very serious issues between the two countries uh, we need to try and resolve those uh, but just india wanting to resolve those are not going to help uh, the chinese have to be equally keen uh, to you know push ahead with this relationship uh, and and enter into a very cooperative sort of an arra uh, arrangement with india which necessarily seem to be the case so regardless of what we might want from our relationship with china uh, it also depends on what the chinese want from the relationship with india so there is a big question mark out there uh, the second thing is that uh, given the dynamics of uh, two very large countries like india and china uh, you know and and the kind of uh, positioning uh, they are looking for uh, in the global system i think uh, it is bound to be natural that there will be areas of contestation between the two sides uh, and in a and in a setting where there are very many contentious issues between the two at a bilateral level when you add the strategic contestation uh, to that uh, framework then it becomes even more difficult to manage this relationship uh, to be honest uh, i think both sides uh, have managed to do reasonably well uh, notwithstanding what happened at doklam the very fact that doklam did not enter uh, end up in some kind of a shooting match uh, and better sense prevailed on both sides they found a via media to disengage from that place i think goes to the credit of both sides now 
the fact that both sides can claim victory uh, is all right. It doesn't really matter much. Uh, but from my point of view, uh, you know, they managed this relationship. But I would hope that what has happened today, while the discussions happened today, there would have been greater focus on trying to beef up the kind of uh, border um, uh, mechanisms which are already in place uh, to beef them up so much so uh, that, you know, these kind of incidents uh, can be prevented in future. Uh, and, you know, they, we can even preempt some of these incidents from taking place because they actually uh, really spoil the mood and with uh, unrestrained rhetoric coming from the Chinese side, you know, it has enhanced the suspicions and distrust of China in many an uh, Indian mind. Uh, you know, when you start challenging India's uh, position in or start questioning it in Andamans, when you start mm -hmm. talking about POK, when you start talking about other areas along the border, then clearly, you know, uh, I don't think any Indian policy maker uh, will be able to rest easy or able to take whatever the Chinese say at face value. So I think those are issues which we also need to look at uh, as we go ahead. Indeed, indeed. Jabin Jacob, you know, as, as far as the entire India-China issue itself is concerned, do you believe that there is going to be an offsetting of ties, especially after what has happened between Xi Jinping and Modi? It's all gone on well. The PLA could intervene at some point in time and try and offset that good bilateral that we've had at the, at the, level, at the highest level and you know, create another Doklam-like situation somewhere else. Look, I think uh, we in India should not assume that there are differences between the PLA and their commander-in-chief. We cannot make policy or prepare if we work on that assumption. We should always assume that the orders come from the top and that all of these is very much part of the, uh, it's a part of the plan as far as the Chinese are concerned. Uh, as far as India-China relations are concerned, you know, you mentioned the word reset. I know this uh, gives the impression that the governments are actively trying to reset the relationship towards a positive direction. But what I would argue is that uh, you know, starting from the Depsung incident in 2013, the Chumur incident when Xi Jinping visited in 2014, and now Doklam, basically we are headed to a reset uh, that is not necessarily positive. Hmm. I think India-China relations are entering a very, very difficult stage. And this is as, uh, you know, this is again, as Mr. Sareen said, this is quite a natural process. There are two large countries with growing and growing capabilities. So what's economic. the way forward then? The way forward is really to enhance strategic communications. I think it is not sufficient that just the leaders meet, however regularly they meet. Leaders, uh, the, the heads of government can only have so much time or so much bandwidth to discuss issues. What we need are uh, more dialogues across teams, across uh, a range of issues between senior officials, middle level officials, and involving uh, junior level officials. I mean, the BRICS, I think, is unique in one of the aspects that they do is bring together junior diplomats uh, to meet with each other. And if you take the relationship between the US and China, for example, look at the number of dialogues that they have. We have nowhere near that number of dialogues. And unless we can enhance the number of dialogues, un unless we can e enhance the number of exchanges between government officials, between military officials, I think that has been mentioned also at this particular uh, summit, and also between academics and at the people-to-people -people level, if we do not do that, I think we are in for a very tough time in India-China relations. Sure. Uh, Shubhama Bhattacharji, you know, as far as India and China are concerned, do you believe that the nations have learnt a lesson from Doklam? Uh, you know, like uh, one of the other panellists pointed out earlier in the programme, no bullets were fired between the two nations. Both nations, both the armies showed restraint. So is that really how the ties are going to go uh, going ahead? Because at the end of the day, uh, economics should trump the military. You know, um India-China relationships will be a bit of a habit of throwing surprise. So to say that uh, you know the, uh, that even though there wasn't any 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 uh, bullets were fired, uh, that it was any less tense is definitely not the case. And whether that would be the format or whether there would be ability to overcome these and uh, set ties on economic matters, I don't think that's possible to separate the two. If you look at Chinese relationship economically with the other countries of South Asia, it's uh, look at the way it has handled relationship with Philippines. And right now, for instance, it's economic uh, expansion that it's trying to do in Malaysia. And that's already creating a def uh, tension with the ethnic Bhumiputras. So you'd see that Chinese economic 
involvement with other countries is also an extension of its uh, military involvement. So these, these, these sort of things are pretty much clear. So they go the, hand in hand as far as uh, the Chinese absolutely. are concerned. Con considering that the PLA is also a large investor and it's, 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 it, has a, it, 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 it guides the fortunes of quite a few of the companies. So to say that the two would be working separately is obviously def definitely not possible. The, what is going to happen is that I agree that there should be more dialogue between India and China. But China, remember, does not accept India as a strategically equal partner. So to that, or an equal country. So to that extent, while USA and China do have a lot of fields where they do uh, discuss uh, stuff, China does not believe and at least has not shown much of an inclination to offer that sort of a forum or platform vis-a-vis -vis India. Right. BRICS is a, therefore an interesting avenue which has come up where many of these things could and uh, can be settled down. Fair enough. Yes, sir. Sushant Sarin, you wanted to say something. No, just on this business about, uh, you know, economic cooperation. I th see, I I'm all for economic cooperation between countries. Uh, I think uh, trade is something between countries which actually enriches all countries. Uh, and it nobody does a benefit, uh, you know, a favor to the other country by trading with them. So it's, it's a mutually beneficial thing. But I don't think... Uh, uh, we should overestimate the role of economics also. Uh, to some extent, it is true that you develop vested interests uh, and uh, people, uh, you know, if you have a large market like India, uh, which is your fifth largest or sixth largest market, uh, then of course there is also an incentive uh, to not get into a kind of a tiff uh, which could actually uh, completely bust this market apart. Uh, so while that is there, at the same time when you look at uh, China's relationship, for example, with Japan or with Taiwan, uh, and you see the kind of aggressive moves that the Chinese have made, even though uh, their dependence uh, on trade on J uh, Japan and Taiwan, uh, as well as on investments uh, with both these countries and also the US for that matter, mm -hmm. uh, is a lot more than what it is with India. And yet, uh, that did not stop the Chinese uh, from actually, you know, uh, pushing their weight around uh, in many of uh, the so-called disputes. There was a time when they kept quiet. Today, they think uh, they are in a position that they can actually uh, push ahead with their claims in many of the areas. So I think, uh, you know, it's something which on balance can go either way. Uh, this this business about economic cooperation between countries. It's not necessarily the magic bullet which will ensure that uh, all will be uh, hunky-dory between any two countries. Sure. All right. You know, I've got uh, two minutes left on the program, so I'm going to quickly try and squeeze in two comments from my, from my guests. You know, Ambassador, beginning with you, uh, on the whole, as far as the grouping itself is concerned, what do you believe are the takeaways? The BRICS, I think, has been able to make some very good statements as far as the global issues are concerned, whether it is climate change or IMF. and So there is a direction in which the five countries can uh, go together and that direction has been very clearly laid out. The accreditation agency and evaluation, uh, our Prime Minister had also spoken about some uh, rating agency, mm, rating agency yes. solar alliance, Because energy. we can't depend on Western we rating agencies. We can't depend on Western yes. agencies. So as far as that is concerned, that agenda continues, that agenda has been strengthened. And on that direction, I think the BRICS countries will be able to move forward. And uh, Jabin Jacob, would you call the BRICS 2017 summit a success on the whole? Well, question of success or failure depends on what our expectations are. Hmm. And if our foreign ministry declares that, well, expectations have been met. Uh, and especially with regard to the you know, declaration of several of these uh, Pakistan-based terrorist groups openly, uh, I think that in that sense, it was definitely a success. Um, I think the issue really going forward is what next? Uh, you know, it's not uh, good enough for us to stop having expectations. And, you know, BRICS is actually a very unbalanced grouping. Hmm. You know, China and India are by far the biggest economic players uh, and also the most significant uh, and equally significant political players. And if uh, the other three economies are not able to sort of get their act together, then BRICS uh, really has a problem going forward. So the question is, how do India and China manage to get this entire grouping working uh, together in, the econo in economic terms as well? Right. Shubhapai, close the show for us with your concluding remark on whether BRICS will continue to be relevant in the years to come. BRICS will continue to be relevant, but that we'll have another adventure around India-China tail is something that you can be absolutely sure.
Okay, fine. All, all right. On that note, then we'll call it a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. I'd like to thank all my guests on the program, S.R. Tayal, Sushant Sareen, Shubhamai Bhattacharji, and Jabin Jacob. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. That's all the time we have today. See you again next time.